So uh, let's get started. I'm, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Sebastien Lemieux, who's going to be uh, giving the QLS Kambam Lutmer Mikim seminar today. Uh, uh, Sebastien and I go back a long time. We did our masters together when we were both at the University of Montreal. Uh, Sebastien went on to complete his PhD at the University of Montreal, uh, uh, setting up some of the nicer um, bioinformatics approaches to study RNA structure. Um, he then uh, took a unusual or, or slightly unusual turn towards a postdoc in industry uh, before coming back to uh, Eric um, uh, through a stop through Concordia actually. Uh, so he's now a PI at uh, the Institut de Recherche uh, en Immunologique et Cancer, uh, Eric at the University of Montreal. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at uh, DIRO, the Department of uh, Computer Science Department at the University of Montreal. And he's been doing really amazing work uh, at the intersection of, of, of gene expression uh, in, uh, in the context of a particular diseases and uh, machine learning. And so I think that his work will really be appealing to a lot of, of you uh, and I'm Thank you very much, Sebastian, for joining us uh, and agreeing to give this talk. And if people in the audience have questions during the talk, type them in the chat and I will uh, ask them uh, during, during the presentation if needed, if there are, let's say, urgent questions. And otherwise, you can keep your questions until the end of the presentation where Sebastian will have some time to, to answer your questions. So let's get started. Thank you again, Sebastian. Thank you, Mathieu, for the, for the introduction. Uh, the the talk today will be in a in a in a few sections, and I'm trying to build something up to the moment where I will present this this novel approach to identify biomarkers. Uh, and I will start up with presenting uh, uh, an example of a signature identification, and we'll, we'll see the the details on this. And then I will move on. <clears throat> for a demonstration that uh, gene signature are naturally resistant to interpretation, which is something that whenever you apply machine learning, it's something that, that people want. And from that, I will really stress that using univariate method to identify biomarker is still something really useful and that the current method are not working so well. And I will present a novel approach that, is, that we call IPC. So let's start with the, the first part. So in the first part, so this is a project that we uh, that we have with clinician at HMR, Sylvie Lachance, La Lambert Busque, and Claude Perrault. And we started that quite a few years uh, ago. And it's uh, the idea is to make a predictor to predict what we call graft versus host disease. So whenever someone has cancer, one of the possible treatment is uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And in that context, what, what you do is you take the immune system of a donor and you transfer it to the cancer patient with the hope that the immune system will eradicate the cancer. The, the danger of this is what is called the graft versus host disease. And this is a situation where the immune system that is transplanted to the patient actually turns against the patient. And this is a very dangerous condition that happened maybe in 15% of the, uh, the transplantation. And the idea of this project was to use RNA-seq on the donor cell to predict whether there will be a GVHD, a graft versus host disease. Let's talk about the, the data set that we built for this. So we, to, together with the collaborator, we had access to 329 samples of donor for which we extracted CD4 cell, uh, gene expression was measure, measured with RNA-seq. We ended up with 29,000 covariate per sample in order to make that prediction. And even worse, we only have 39 positive out of the 329 uh, cohort. Uh, so that creates even more complication when you try to make, a, to make prediction. The methodology that we decided to put together in order to, uh, to solve this problem, we decided to start with really simple methodology. So essentially a logistic regression or for the ML uh, amateur in the, in the room, that would be a neural network with no hidden layer. So that's, that's a very fancy way to say logistic regression. One particular detail, we were adding L2 regularization to the logistic uh, regression and we were using 
Z transform log expression of the uh, of the the gene uh, that we were using. Using this, there's definitely too many co covariates, so we have to do a selection. We decided to do a selection based on standard deviation, so picking the top gene with the highest standard deviation throughout the cohort. We also decided to change the level of regularization that we would that we would apply. So Bianca, a Z transform is when you take your measure and you subtract the average that you have across the court and then you divide by the standard deviation. So it means that after the Z transformation, all the covariate end up having an average of zero and a standard deviation of one. So they, are, they become all comparable. But the reason we did that is so that the coefficient that we get inside the logistic regression could be comparable to one another. But we'll, we'll come to that in a, in a minute or so. But all that to say, this is a very simple methodology, very well defined, but we're, we still end up with two parameters that we need to decide beforehand. The, the number of genes that we want to present to this algorithm and the strength of the regularization. So we decided to go forward and do what is called a grid search. Essentially, we test all possible way to decide how many genes we're presenting. So on this side, this would be Small, small number of gene up to a rather large number of gene. And on the other scale, this is low regularization down to a high regularization. So when I say low regularization, I mean essentially a standard logistic regression. When I say high regularization, uh, I believe this is sometime in the uh, statistician crowd called the ridge regression. Um, but that, that's less of, my, less, less of my background. What you see in color on this side, is the actual area under the rock curve of this predictor, and the color code is here. We decided to pick two different predictors that were, that were identified. Thank you, Celia. Uh, two, two different predictors that, that came out through this, uh, this optimization. On the left side, you have the predictor that produced the best accuracy throughout all this, this analysis. It was using 120 genes and was producing an AUC that was one, uh, 0.7 AUC. And this is the black line that you see on the rock curve on this side. The other predictor that we selected here was one that was using a lot more gene so that we could do gene ontology enrichment and these type of analysis. Uh, it was slightly less efficient with the 0.63 uh, area under the, the rock curve. The red line that we see in the background here is the current predictor that is used by clinicians to decide whether they go ahead with a, with a graft or not. So both predictor, both the blue one with lots of gene and the black one with small number of gene were a significant increase in the accuracy of what is currently used in practice. And we were super happy with that. Even if the, you know, the performance is not stellar, we thought it really increased what can be used in, in practice. So we presented that to our friend, the, uh, the, the clinician, uh, and they were not that happy. Uh, they, they, came up, they came up asking a lot of questions. And the first thing they wanted to see is as we, uh, and if I can draw on this, if I, increase the number of genes that I include in the, uh, in the classifier, you see that the AUC, the performance of the algorithm, is increasing at some point and then reducing at some point, suggesting that some of the genes that are added iteratively, they really help the signature to make the prediction. And some of them, when they are added, they tend to uh, go against the, uh, the prediction. And so, as you can imagine, the question that was asked is, which gene is actually driving this, this prediction because they want to know what's the mechanism behind um, creating this, this uh, graft versus, graph versus host disease and only predicting is not enough. That's what we learned as we were working on this, on this project. So one of the things that uh, Jonathan Seguin was the, uh, the, the person working on this project at that time decided to do, and this is the graph on the, on the right side here, what he decided to do was to extract the 180 gene that are common between the two signature. Remember, I'm adding them based on standard deviation. So 180 gene are shared between those two signature. And what we see on this graph here is the coefficient that is used inside the logistic regression. You can see that as the impact of that gene to drive that specific prediction. 
And we can make a few observations on this. The first thing is that they follow one another, which is a good thing. So if a gene was really promoting GVHD in the small signature, it's also promoting GVHD in the large signature. So that, that's a good thing. The bad thing that you see here is that the order in which, you, in which you would list these genes are really changing a lot. The top gene that would appear on the, small, on the large signature would be quite different than the top gene you would see on the small signature. So if we were to identify which gene have an impact on the prediction, it really depends on those uh, hyperparameters that we were setting as we were building those signatures. So it becomes very difficult to, to answer that question. The second thing that I would like you to notice, and that's really, really small, uh, but, but you can zoom in on your screen. So this is a specific number of the parameters inside the logistic regression. And what you see if we, if we draw this line here and we look at equivalent position, what we see is that on the large signature, what we see is a 0 0.05 and what you see here is 0.5. So it's a tenfold difference and there's 10 times more gene in the large signature. So what it means is essentially that as we increase the number of genes, because we're using an L2 regularization inside the logistic regression, the classifier really, really want to distribute as much as possible the weight in which each gene participate to the prediction. So essentially, as we include more gene, we end up with something more robust, but less interpretable. Any gene will participate just a small bit into the, uh, into the prediction. So when we, we came back with this, uh, you, can, you can imagine that our collaborator were uh, a bit puzzled by what to do, what to do next. Uh, using, and I, I'll skip this, but using the larger signature, we, we did gene ontology analysis and there was lots of pitfalls, but when we identify what are the pathways that are activated, we would find nothing uh, particular that would, that would come up. But, but still we had a signature that seems to be working but without any way to explain how it was working. So that was a, uh, that was a bit disappointing. Uh, at, at pretty much the same time, uh, I, I came to see this uh, older paper that is coming from Igor Jurisica's lab in University of Toronto, where in this, in this paper, they tried to identify a prognosis model for non-small cell lung cancer. And they came up with this uh, supposedly fantastic six gene signature uh, to, to do prognosis in, uh, in, in lung cancer. And that part of the paper is very classic. You've probably seen hundreds of those paper. Uh, those signatures sometimes validate or do not validate externally, but that's not the point. The really nice part about this paper is the second part where they tried to assess how good their signature was. And what they did is they created 10 million random signature, they evaluate their prognosis potential, and they compare their own signature to that. And they found that only 1,700 signature within those 10 million are better than the one that they were proposing. So they said, our signature is pretty good, right? And, and they're, oh, it's, it's true. But if you flip the interpretation, then you also see that there's 1,700 better signature than the one that they are proposing. And now you can see that this 10 million signature is just a small subset of all possibilities of taking six with, within 20,000 genes. So if we extrapolate, they come up with the idea that for that specific task, there is likely to be half a million very good six gene prognosis signature. And that's, that's part of the conclusion of the paper, and I really encourage you to, to go read it. So it means that good signatures are not unique, and they are not unique because genes are tied together, and two genes that correlate a lot could be replaced by one another very, very easily. That's one of the reasons why they, they are not unique. So seeing this, a student in the lab a student in, in, in the lab decided to do something a bit crazier. So this, this is work from Asya Trafimov. Uh, and what she decided to do, she decided to 
put together three data set with three different prediction class. So the first one is GTEx. So these are LT tissue, 9,000 sample, 30 different class. And the goal of the predictor is to predict from which tissue does a given expression profile comes. The second one is TCGA, about 10,000 sample, 30 different tumor type. And the goal was to predict from which type of cancer the a given expression profile is coming. And the last one is the subpart of uh, breast cancer within TCGA that is about 1,000 patients in five breast cancer subtype. And the goal here is to predict which is the uh, breast cancer subtype. She decided that the conclusion should not be algorithm specific. So she applied three different algorithms that are really baseline kind of algorithm, the k-nearest neighbor, the random forest, and again, the uh, regularized logistic regression. And this is the result she came with. And what she did when, in order to decide how many gene we would present to these specific algorithm, she decided to pick random subsets of genes. So, so, so she would talk by, start by taking a single gene randomly picked and trying to build all these three predictors based on that. And that would be repeated to get a sense of the variability that we see in that type of performance. And as you can imagine, starting with this project, we assume random selection of gene doesn't seem like a good idea. It, it doesn't. But if you look at this on the GTEC data set, when you reach about 50 genes, so these are 50 randomly picked gene across all the transcriptome. The two nonlinear predictor, random forest and KNN, were achieving close to 80% uh, accuracy in that prediction. The other thing that you can see is that there's not a lot of outliers that we were seeing, meaning when you pick those random 50 gene, there's not a lot of combination that produce bad classifier also. Uh, you might wonder what's happening with the logistic regression, why it's lying um, uh, beside. I won't go into this. We still have a few hypotheses, but we need to, to test them to try to, to figure out what's happening. Uh, it, it, it's either the optimization of the regularization or something that is really specific to the logistic regression, the fact that it's a, a linear type of algorithm. If we look on the other data set, we're seeing a very similar trend. They tend to be shifted slightly depending probably on the complexity of the task or the, the quality of the data that is used. In the specific context of the breast cancer, what you see is a much higher baseline. This is due to the fact that the data is really, uh, really unbalanced. So there's, there's some classes that are really more frequent, so the baseline is higher. It's more difficult to see what's happening on that specific, uh, on that specific data set. So that was a bit surprising. Um, and, and what we can do with this is to realize that methods for deriving signature, uh, they either make heavy use of single gene assessment for, to pre-filter the gene, so that would be one way. So in the GBHD project, we're using standard deviation to pick our gene. That's not very fancy. That's not very clever. In uh, uh, the random signature project, we're using random selection of gene. That's not very clever also. Uh, so we think that in order to build a signature, we'll need to make an assessment of single gene to decide if we take them or not. Uh, the other thing is that once we have a signature, we are definitely forced to go back and investigate that signature gene by gene. So having a tool to make a univariate assessment of the role of a gene inside a predictor is something that is, that is becoming definitely useful in later stage of that project. And that, that's all good because there's so many algorithms to do differential expression and analysis that we could repurpose for, for that, uh, that use that we just need to pick, right? I mean, this has been working for, you know, over 10, 15 years, maybe. You probably know DSEC or EDGEAR or LIMA. Uh, if, if you're old enough to work with microarrays, then some of those techniques were already developed there. But we're not sure we can use them. And, and for, to show that, we'll start with a, a very cartoonish um, situation. So suppose now we, 
reduce our focus to a single gene. So we only look at one gene and specifically between two groups. And we're wondering if that gene is expressed at different level between those two groups. And I'm, I'm not saying which gene it is. These are just, uh, these are simulated data. And if you take a single measure, then you end up with the expression that is slightly higher in group A, but not much. There's nothing we can say. Uh, is this difference statistically significant? We don't know. There's no replication. So you go forward and you do three replicates instead. You redesign the experiment. With three replicates, you still are under the impression that group A expresses that gene slightly more. If you run a t-test in that specific context, and these are normally distributed, so the t-test would, would be okay in that context. So you end up with a difference that is not statistically significant, and you're not too sure. But your lab is rich, and you decide to do 10 samples in each group. And then all of a sudden, the relationships start changing. The, the magic of sampling, right? You were unlucky with the first three sample. Now you see a, a larger picture, but still the test is insignificant. So you don't conclude. Now your lab is definitely much richer and you go with a hundred sample in each of the, the two group. And what you see is still the same picture that we saw before, a very slight difference, a lot of noise in the experiment. But then you see that this, the the test is starting to decide that the difference suddenly becomes statistically significant. Now you're super, super rich, consortium rich, and you do a thousand sample in each group. And if you look at, if you look at the scatter plot, you learn nothing. It's always exactly the same result. With, I mean, all these, these RNA-seq were really wasted. But now the test is super happy. And now the difference becomes really significant without any doubt. Okay. So what, what just happened there? Why did we end up looking at a graph that to us, when we look at the expression of that gene, nothing is changing, but the test is changing all the time. So for the, the student in the room, if you want to read old text, I would really suggest that you go read that paper by John Tucky. It's a... Uh, what, 60 years old uh, paper, but it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And one of the things that is said in that paper is that you're always better looking for an approximate answer to the right question. And I'm really highlighting right question. And the idea of what just happened is essentially the fact that through the statistical test, we were not asking the right question. And I will try to convince you of that. And the reason why we're not asking the right question is pretty simple. It's really biology that was playing a trick on us. Okay, If you think about what the t-test is doing, it's applying a test on the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis of the t-test, what is it in that specific context? It is that the gene is expressed at the same level in the two group. The level of expression is equal and, and not biology equal, which is a bit fuzzy, mathematically equal precisely, precisely equal. <clears throat> so that, that's what's happening, and, and, and we'll see. Okay, uh, in, another, uh, in another paper that is quite interesting, and you will see that this is coming to a very similar conclusion. So in this paper uh, published in 2014, what they were trying to do was to establish whether you should invest in more replicates or deeper sequencing which is a, a fair question to ask. And they tried to answer that through simulation by subsampling both the reads and the replicate. And what you see in this graph here is the number of differentially expressed genes that they were able to identify at a fixed FDR using the, the software EdgeR based on the combined uh, depth versus replicate that they compute as a cost of the experiment. And what you see, when I was looking at that graph, I was assuming that the graph would somehow plateau somewhere. And this here, this plateau would be the number of genes that is differentially expressed between those two samples. And when you look at the graph, where is this plateau? There's no plateau. So how many genes are differ differentially expressed when you treat these MCF7 cell with estradiol? It's very difficult. It looks totally linear, 
So based on these results, I would assume that all genes are differentially expressed with respect to the statistical test we're applying, okay? Remember, the test is looking whether the gene has equal expression in both groups. And what this result is saying is that as you increase the depth and the number of replicates, you will be able to show that statistically significantly all genes are slightly differentially expressed between the two conditions. Uh, but that, that was not the conclusion of the paper, but you, you, can, you can see it for yourself if you, if you go read it. So this leaves us with a rather complicated question. So what is a good biomarker? Uh, now we get a sense that using the statistical test is probably not a good way to find a, a marker that is predictive. So if so, here what I'm showing on, on the left is two group with the level of expression on the x-axis, and if the two group are express, expressing that gene on a very completely non-overlapping distribution, uh, the capacity to predict is you know it's very good. Uh, the statistical test will have a very low p-value and every, everyone would, would agree. If we are in a situation like this with enough sample, the statistical test will conclude that the average of the two distributions are different, and they are. It's right, okay? But that gene is a much less good predictor than the first one. If you look at the hypothetical scenario on the right side, that's a situation where the average of the two group is exactly the same but it's a very good predictive gene because knowing the expression of that gene, you would be able to know from which group, group the sample is coming from. So we are in the situation where we really create those two different features for a given gene, uh, whether it's predictive or the, there's a different expression. I won't go into the detail of partial marker, but you can end up in a situation where only a fraction of the sample can be unambiguously classified using a given marker. And these are not necessarily uninteresting. They, they could be quite useful in some context. I'll probably, so, so, so in this context, I'm using actual data, and this is taken from uh, the Lucigen cord. So the Lucigen cord is a sample from AML, acute myeloid leukemia. And at the time of uh, when we produced those, gra those graphs, there was about 400 samples in this cord. Uh, and uh, we're using what's called MLL subtype of, uh, of AML, trying to find biomarkers of that subtype. And this represents 33 samples versus 371. And what you see here is just three genes that were handpicked to show different scenario. And the first one is a gene that is a fairly good predictor. There's little overlap for a large fraction of the sample. The second one, there's much higher overlap and the third one is a very bad predictor. I mean, only, what, seven sample would be really unambiguously classified using that specific gene. And what you see on the bottom part is different algorithms that were applied to these specific genes showing what kind of result they, they would get. And what I would like you to realize here is that they are essentially saying very different thing about those, those genes. And most specifically, you can, you can look at Limavum versus D2 and EDGAR, and you would see that the, the p-value are very different from one to the other, and the rank in which that gene was ranked with that specific algorithm would change a lot from one algorithm to the other. So this is what we will be exploring. And I will be presenting the software IPC, which is the one that we are currently, um, currently exploring and show how different this behave with respect to the other statistical uh, algorithms that, that are used. So if we talk a bit about what EPSI does. So when we decided to look for biomarkers, we decided we would, we would do it in a very simple fashion. We would find predictive genes by identifying which genes are actually predictive. There's, there's no more magic to that. So the, other, the algorithm goes like this. So we, for each gene, we do a, uh, an independent analysis. And then once we've selected a given gene, we would pick each of the sample. We would remove them from the data set. We will build a classifier using the rest of the data set. And we will predict from which group the left out sample should come from based on that classifier. Uh, 
So FC contained three arbitrary decisions that we had to take. First, a cross validation to make this estimate of performance in a, in a, in a robust way. And we decided to use leave one out uh, validation, cross validation. The classifier will be KDE, the kernel density estimator. And the metric that we're using is MCC, uh, the Matthews correlation coefficient, which provide a sort of trade-off between accuracy and specificity in that, in that specific context. And we go through, through that algorithm. I will give a bit more details here. So when we open up that algorithm a bit, so now you can see if we take an example of a gene like this, we would take one specific sample, we remove it, and then we can make a prediction here based on the uh, KDE. The KDE is like creating a density plot. And I, I, I hope most of you have done density plot before. And at a given expression level, you ask what is the probability that I come from one or the other distribution? And the answer to the classification is that probability. So it means that when we run the, K, the KDE for a given sample in a given gene, we end up not with a class that is predicted, but rather a prediction of a, a probability to belong to a given class. So in this context here, we're mostly in the blue class. So the KDE tells us that there's 90% chance we're coming from the blue class. In this situation here, the classifier is more ambiguous. It's essentially saying that there, there's a 50-50 chance we're coming from the blue or the red class. And then what we do, because the, because the MCC requires a discrete class prediction, what we do is we decided to sample using that probability different uh, uh, contingency table. And we do that 100 times. And from that, we can compute multiple MCC. And we can get a good assessment of what's the performance of that specific classifier. So there's a few things that is important to realize in that specific context is that the accurate the, the, the MCC that we return for a given gene is really measured for out of training uh, sample. So it means that whatever accuracy we get here, we would expect it would uh, still function uh, on future sample to come. But that gene is, uh, I'm not sure I'm getting the, the, the question, but that gene is predicted for a subset of the population. So, um, so for example, if you look at, at a given gene here, what it says is that it would do a correct classification 90% of the time based on the sample that were within the training set that were not left out. But one thing to realize is that we're not that interested to identify genes that are predictive within our training set. If we want to design signature, we want genes that will be predictive for, for future sample to come. Okay. So feel free to ask your question if you, if you think I didn't answer the right question. So let's dig a bit deeper on, on this algorithm. So I'm taking the, the, the PDPN gene as a marker for uh, the specific subset of leukemia, the T1517, or also called the PML-RARA fusion uh, AML. Uh, and, and we published this marker in that paper, so feel free to read about the leukemia biology of podoplanin in that, in that specific paper. So I will really stick to the numbers here and the, and the algorithm. And what you see here is the level of expression of the podoplanin gene in both the uh, PML-RARA fusion subgroup and all the other leukemia in the, in the cohort. And you can see that it's a fairly good predictor but uh, as uh, Bianca was suggesting, it's not working for all the population. It's only working for a fraction of the population, but a fairly large fraction of the population. What you see on the right is an experiment that we done by subsampling. So this is pretty much the full cohort of the, the decision that we had. And if we, if we subsample this cohort down to a three versus three, which is the setup in which most of the algorithm like DSEC, AJAR, and VOOM were, were designed, 
then we can look at how the different algorithm behave for different size of cohorts. And what you see on this part here is the p-value that is returned by the different algorithm. And as you see, the algorithm would have a more significant p-value as the cohort become larger. So this represents exactly what I, what I showed in my cartoon example at the beginning. As the cohort become larger, it becomes easier. There's more statistical power to confirm that the expression is slightly different. And the algorithm because become more and more certain that the, this gene is differentially expressed. If we look at the MCC that is returned by the FC algorithm, you see a very different profile. What you see is if the cohort is too small, then the result is very, very variable. The reason for that is pretty simple. When you do leave one out cross-validation on the three versus three, then you essentially skip one sixth of the whole data set by removing one sample. So you're really hurting the predictor. But as the cohort become larger, this, the, the, the accuracy, that the, the, the stability that you get on the MCC become much better. And you essentially get a very flat picture. As the cohort become larger, the uh, assessment of this MCC become uh, more certain and less variable. And this is what we like. So as the cohort become larger, the result is just more certain. If we look at two different genes, here I'm showing KLLN, which is a much less interesting biomarker. So you end up with a gene that apparently looks to be differently expressed between the two subgroups. That's, I think we can agree with that. And the statistical tests are also showing the same behavior. But then when we run the FC algorithm, we see that the MCC is still very variable at three versus three. But as the cohort become larger, then you see that the MCC falls back to zero, saying essentially that this gene is a very uh, bad predictor. Knowing the expression of that gene would not allow you to classify between uh, PML rara AML or a non PML rara AML. Okay, that's all good, but if you've done some RNA-seq analysis, you've probably heard the fact that there's no way we should use only the p-value. It's very important to also use the, uh, the effect size, so the log fold change between the two groups, and we have to make some kind of balance between the p-value and the log fold change. And I've been saying that for, for years. Without having a clear way to do this balance, uh, I've been repeating that. So what we, what we see here is on the x-axis, the log fold change, but for all the genes. And again, I'm, sh I'm showing different subsampling, roughly the full cohort on the right side, and on the left side, a tree versus tree, which is the situation in which the, the statistics were, were designed. I'm only presenting Lima Voom here, as it seems, in our hand, this is really the algorithm that seems to be performing the best between the, uh, the different statistical uh, algorithms. And what we see as the cohort become larger and larger, we see that the MCC stabilizes very fast with respect to its relationship between the, the effect size and the statistic, which is a good thing. And on the bottom side, we see that Lima is just amplifying its p-value as the cohort size increases. Another thing that we can see is the size of the dot here represents the standard variation. When we do the subsampling, we have the possibility to see if we were to resample, would we get the exact same p-value? And what we see is that as we increase the size of the, uh, of the cohort, the statistics become more and more uh, variable in terms of the p-value that is returned. And this is roughly an artifact that we're reaching very, very small value close to, close to zero. We don't have this effect with the MCC. As the cohort becomes larger, the assessment of the predictability of each biomarker become uh, sharper, more, more precise, less variable. So that, that again, is a, is a pretty good thing. If we look at the statistic, this, is, this was not unique to Limavum, so Limavum is, is shown here. If we look at DSEC, which is also a very popular software, or EDGAR, which is surprisingly weird in its behavior, uh, that, that's something that, that we've noticed uh, quite frequently. Then you see that the property that we've just identified is common to all the statistics that were uh, that that were used before. Uh, 
So that that's all good, but then we're just looking in, a, in a, either by picking specific gene or by looking at overall behavior of those p-value versus MCC. If we take a look, if we want to compare whether these algorithms are returning the same gene, would I be identifying the same subset of gene if I was using this different algorithm? Then it becomes very difficult because as you saw, the p-value from different software seems to mean completely different things. So the threshold that we need to apply to a p-value seems to be something that we need to change in order to get a list of genes. Worse than that, the MCC used by EPSC, we have no clue what should be a good threshold on that. It doesn't have the sort of magic 0 0.05 threshold that we tend to apply to, to p-value. So let's start with a, a, an easy way to do that. We'll take the first top 20 gene for each of, the, each of the method. And what you see on the top part here is for two subsets that we analyze. First one is the T1517, which is the PML-RARA fusion. The other one is another type of fusion that represents a subtype of AML. And what we see here is the number of unique genes to that specific method in their top 20 genes. And the first thing I, I want you to, to notice is the fact that EPSI actually has the lowest number of unique genes. So what does that mean? It essentially says that EPSI is not going and fishing genes that all the other methods would disagree with, but rather it's fishing between genes that were already declared as significant by the other, other three methods. So it seems to be the method that is most in agreement with all the other. Yeah, I, I'm getting to that, Mark. I'm getting to that. <clears throat> so the, the top 20 is, is good, but not so good. Um, so I believe that was the suggestion that, that Mark was just proposing. And the idea that, that we did is we build 20 random designs. So again, taking 30 samples at random within the, the full cohort and saying they, become, they belong to the group to make a prediction. And since they are picked randomly, since they are picked randomly, then there should be no gene that, that is called to be predictive in that context. And what we do is, so you've got the 20 uh, random design here, you've got the two design that we were analyzing before. So we were pretty happy to see that MCC values were higher for categories for which there's an actual biology behind. So that, that's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good uh, thing to notice. And what we did was to fix what we call the empirical false positive rate at the level of our statistic that would pick, let's say, 1% of the genes. And then we can have another EFPR at 10 minus, uh, 10 minus, uh, 10 minus 5. And these are the two curves that we get here. And the idea here is that the same protocol could be applied also to the p-value-based statistics such as Limavum, and then we obtain threshold that would, on the random design, return the same level of false positive. So using this approach, we think that we end up with threshold that would be equivalent from different methods, and then we can start comparing what kind of uh, genes we can, we can identify. Now I'm, I'm realizing that the time is, is, is flying by. Uh, so I'll do this, and in the interest of time, I will show this. So now if we look at these different values on a, on a global picture, what we see here is for the, uh, the PML RARA again, so 30 sample versus 625, and we will be using uh, an EFPR threshold of 10 minus 5, 10 apart minus 5. And what we see here is that the genes that are identified in the top, top 20 for the two methods are overlapping in some way, but not that much. Those that are shown using the EFPR end up quite different between the two methods. So the number of genes that are identified by one and the other is really starting to change. And if we try to look at two different methods, here I'm showing VOOM on one side, DSEC on the other, and the MCC on this side here, then you see something quite interesting. And the first pair that I will look at is PDPN versus ARH-GAP4. And these are the star in the triangle here. Uh, 
And what I would like you to realize is that the PDPN here, the star, is showing within the top 20 for Zoom, within the top 20 for MCC. But if you look at the result for DSEC, it's not even passing the threshold of empirical FPR, okay? So that gene would be completely rejected by DSEC, would be one of the star by Zoom and one of the star by MCC. If we look at another gene that is showing a slightly different profile, the one in triangle here, you see that it's really very close to the threshold for doing the top 20, and it's the star gene for the other algorithm. And both genes are scoring pretty high for the MCC. So this is what I wanted to say when I was saying that it seems that FC is picking the best of those, those different algorithms. Now that's, that's easy if we look at those that perform well with MCC, but let's take a look at those that we would miss using FC. And I will bring your attention to ju just a few, for example, this one here, NCR2, which was one of the top 20 by DSEC. It was not selected at all by Voom and is definitely not selected by FC. And you see the profile here. It's essentially a situation where it's, I mean, we could argue that the average expression between the two groups is different, but that gene as a biomarker would be mostly useless. And that's the kind of gene that is rejected. The two other cases here are situations where there's a strong overlap between the, uh, the two, the two groups. And these, again, are situations that are really, uh, let's say, downrated by, by Epson. Uh, and I will keep this, if there is any question, asking, would that be applicable to single cell sequencing? Uh, and the answer is, we think yes, but there's uh, a few things to figure out yet. And I will skip to the conclusion. So, I, I hope I've convinced you that uh, good signature benefits from using more genes. Uh, it reduces the impact of arbitrary pre-selection. And if you read some of those signature paper, uh, you can be frustrated by the method section where they tell you how they filter out their gene. The regularization that is essential to use in most machine learning and statistical method on, on such large data set really forces the signal to be diffuse, so it's very difficult to extract information for those parameters. Using more gene provide, uh, get, gets you a signature that is more robust to noise, but it's very difficult to interpret. So it means that single gene biomarker uh, can be a preliminary step to signature development. It can be a very useful tool to decipher how a machine learning algorithm is, is working. Uh, and in any case, should be the first thing you apply when you, you work on any cohort. It's just simpler to have a look single uh, gene by gene. Uh, and, and finally, and I, I, one, I think that's probably the most Im important point here is that current approach to identify differentially expressed gene are based on a biologically inappropriate null hypothesis, which is equal expression in both groups. Uh, and I'm not saying that the statistics is wrong. The statistic is really good. Uh, and if you go back to the, the paper uh, describing DSEC and Lima Vum, you will see that everything is fine and, and okay. But they started with this premise that it's possible that a gene is equally expressed, mathematically equally expressed between two cords. And when we use large number of sample, then you know, the crack in that story start to, to show and we start to see that this is, not, this is not the case. And for single cell, we are essentially in a situation where we deal with large cohort. Each cell is like a sample. So we are in this situation de facto with a single sample of a single cell sequencing. And I'll finish with the, the acknowledgement. So people from my lab that work on these different projects, Jeremy Zumer and Asia Trofimov, I've named them in the, in, when, when they, they work on this. Uh, it, this work was not, would not be possible without the collaborator, Guy Sauvageau, Claude Perrault, Sylvie Mada, and Vincent Lavallée, which is now uh, established at St. Justin uh, Research Center. And Eric Audemars is the person behind EPSI. Uh, and I see he's here for, for the talk, so he will be correcting me if I say stupid things. And, and Jonathan Seguin was also working on GVHD, uh, GVHD work. And thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to, to answer questions. I've seen there, there's a few. Thank you very much, Sebastian. That was a, a great talk and I would uh, invite everybody to
uh, joined me thanking Sebastian by uh, clicking some of the funny buttons somewhere in the, um, Zoom. That's a good way to do it. All right, and I'll do it <laughs> live. Um, yes, great talk. Uh, actually, I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, there are a few questions that uh, that people have, and uh, maybe I will invite people to uh, ask those questions live by just turning on your microphone. Okay. Julian, you had a question, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Lamine also. So maybe Julian, if you if you want. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can hear us. I'm, I'm using my PC on a yeah. particular setup, but. Yeah, so I, 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 you know, I thought the I thought that the the talk was very interesting. It was uh, very interesting seeing the applications of this to different clinical situations, uh, different uh, human pathologies per se. Uh, just given my just given my um, uh, clinical medicine background, uh, I was a little bit more drawn towards your talk on acute promyelocytic uh, myeloid uh, myeloid or acute promyelocytic leukemia. Mm -hmm. And uh, given that we're also talking about gene expression at the same time, uh, the, I think the active, the, the current treatment that I'm aware of at this point is all trans retinoic acid for treatment of APML. I was wondering if you, in, um, it's, it's probably maybe a little bit too detached from what your focus is, but I was wondering if you investigated the effect of uh, that medication or uh, similar mechanisms, for example, of other substances. Yeah, so, so, so there's, there's two angles to, to answer the, the question. So the, the first one, unfortunately, uh, I, will, I will sound like lots of people doing uh, computational biology and machine learning and that kind of thing, and I will complain about the data set. Uh, in order to study this from a data set perspective, uh, it would be essential to have fairly large data set uh, where uh, we, we, would, we would compare treatment and, and have them through RNA-seq, uh, this is not trivial. And unfortunately, the data set that we're working with uh, only have 30 of those, of those sample. And uh, I believe that all, none of them was treated with uh, retinoic acid, as these are uh, retrospective study uh, dating back, back to early 2000. Uh, so we, we don't really have this data set to, to work with. The other thing is that most of the method that I've presented are really starting to work well on fairly large data set. So they tend to not being so appropriate for, for smaller data set. In order to use computational methods, is so when we identify genes that are predictive for the, uh, the pro-myelocytic uh, leukemia, uh, the problem, uh, as I said, is that it's rather difficult to decipher which genes are important or which genes are just a secondary uh, reaction to the change in expression on, on the first few genes. If you dig deep, you will find that lots of those genes end up being slightly predictive or slightly differentially expressed. So in order to identify a subset of gene that would drive the biology, I think we're not really there. And this is why I, I try to focus most of what I've presented on identifying genes that are predictive for the classification. Whether they are involved in the biology or not, uh, that, that's a definitely more complicated question and one that might not have an easy answer. That's a, that's a real possibility. Can I, I follow up on, on that point? And uh, so do you think that we, sh we bioinformaticians, biostatisticians should be aiming to have approaches that at the same time will produce good predictive biomarkers and yield some interesting biology? Or are these two things slightly different? And we should not try to do both at the same time because we'll, we'll, we won't succeed at both, but we could do a great job at one and separately good, do a good job at the other. Yeah, so, so that, that's a tough question. That's yeah. a really tough question. So one thing I could say is that Finding good predictor, that's something that falls on us, okay? That's something that we have the tool for and we, we, should, we should design and we should evaluate those predictors. 
and we have a responsibility in showing how robust they are, how generalizable they are. So that that really falls on us, and I think that's something we can do, and that's something that that people are doing better and better as time as time goes on. Whether we find interesting biology, that's a much more difficult question, and especially when we deal with a data set such as the Lucigen data set in which uh, these are not single cells, so it's pools of cells that are sequenced. It's from a patient, so it means there's a genetic background, but there's a whole history of that, that specific patient. So what we find that is predictive could be completely indirect and could point toward a very, you know, uh, very tangential biology. And, and that, you know, if we were to say, yes, we identify the interesting biology, we could be misleading uh, a lot of people. Now, to say that, I'll, I'll quote uh, my colleague, Claude Perrault, who says, well, uh, the, the important thing is that you give us a few starting points. And that I think we should do, okay? So it's not necessarily interesting biology, it's possibly interesting biology. Okay, and that is something we can do. Starting point for doing further analysis, uh, proposing hypotheses that would need to be tested uh, using other data set or in the lab or in, in vitro or that kind of thing. And that's something we should do. It's good, you have very wise collaborators there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, uh, Lamine, I think you had a question. Do you want to ask it orally? I can try to go back to this. Uh... Oh, hi. Um, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, it's, yeah, exactly this plot, right? That's the one, right? Yeah. Um, um, I see that the AUC is declining after a certain point. So, so basically, I mean, I just wanted to know, like, uh, could this be, like, uh, due to like the number of covariates that are included instead of... Um... So we see, we see two effects here. So the first one is the, uh, oops. the first one is the general trend like this. And this trend is to be expected. And it's essentially due to the fact that as we are adding more and more covariate, we're still stuck with 300 or so sample. So essentially, the capacity of the predictor to generalize falls back because it starts to overfit the, the data set. And that's the trend tendency that we are uh, seeing. Uh, as you can see, maybe not so clearly, but if we move in that part of the graph with a very high number of covariate, 2,500 or so, we see that if we have little regularization, we perform badly. And when we hit, hit the, good, the, the right spot of regularization, we recover part of the performance and then it starts falling back again. So we can use some trick from, from the machine learning background to try to deal with that. But as you see, the general trend is really a decline as we add more genome. So that, that's one part. The okay. other part is what's happening here. Part of the question is, uh, like, I, I was just a little bit worried about the validity of the model. Like, once you, um, for example, like, I think you had about, like, a security, and that only gives you enough power to include about, say, times 15, 15 of that covariate. So once you um, include more, we begin to have, like, unstable uh, estimates of the covariate. I mean, that is, like, more, like, a, and in general, like um, whenever we fit models, I I wonder like should we pay more attention to uh, the like the uh, the validity of the classifier, or do we just throw in like everything? So your your concern here is that there's too many of those genes that are presented for too little uh, positive. In that context, it's yeah. about too many positive. And you're totally right. We would expect actually the model to fail quite early as we reach a number of, uh, of genes that are evaluated that reaches about the number of sample, uh, it should start to fail. And that's the main reason why we always use what's called regularization uh, in order to try to avoid that. And, and it's, not, it's not 
easy black and white situation in terms of the number of genes that the model can tolerate, because as Celia was saying, some of the genes are highly correlated. So in that context, they do not provide the same potential for overfitting. Uh, so this is why we tend to prefer doing these type of grid search, where we essentially give all model the capacity to uh, you know, work or overfit and make sure that the value that we report is really from out of the uh, out of sample uh, evaluation. In that case, using a leave one out uh, evaluation. And this is how we try to protect ourselves from the kind of situation that you are you're suggesting. Thank you. And one, one thing I, I would add about the validity of this model specifically here is that we made, we made one very nasty error it's the fact that the strength of the regularization and the number of genes that we pick, these are two parameters. And here we optimize them using a grid search. But that optimization itself was not cross-validated. So it means that there's still a possibility that we overfit on the selection of the actual regularization parameter or the specific choice of the number of genes that we're presenting. But I, I hope that by presenting the full picture like this and seeing how smooth it is, uh, it gives some sense that we're not, you know, too much overfitting that specific data. But ideally, that would be cross-validated. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sebastien. Um, are there other questions? So I don't see more questions on the chat, but if anybody has more questions, you can just turn on your microphone and speak up. I'm sure Claudia would like to know more about the single cell aspects. I had a question. Okay. So, um, to, Sebastian, this was amazing. And I think this is perfect, especially for the students. I love the way you presented the, you know, the ideas of interpretability and the uh, kind of intuitive look into what these methods are actually looking with the, doing with the data, what you're selecting. And, uh, you know, I, in the end, you come up with this really intuitive way to select the genes that will really differentiate between your populations or your groups, which is great. Now, it just struck me that I wonder if you're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater at some point. And let's see if I can put it in there, you know, the, the way that I'm thinking about it. So we're kind of hoping that these machine learning approaches will do something that we cannot intuitively do. So they will capture this, these nonlinear uh, interaction effects that are not easily visible with the data. But what you're doing and is you're pre-selecting the genes that are well exactly intuitive and the ones we would select just by thinking about it, the ones that are most useful one by one. Are you maybe throwing out somewhere along the way those interactions and effects that we cannot foresee and that we are you know, hoping the machine will do for us. Yeah, so much, so much. So, so we are. Uh, you're right. If we were, and and this is not something we've started yet, but it, it's something that is that is in the plan. If we were to use a method like EPC in order to pre-filter the gene that we would present to a very um, a method that 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 allows to find complex interaction, a deep neural neural network, for example. Uh, then we could very well miss on gene that could participate in that deep neural network by removing them by by FC. And this is this this was the reasoning with these kind of situation here, where we have genes that if we are to evaluate them using the Matthew correlation coefficient, we will reject those genes. Okay, because they they only work for a small fraction of the of the, the, the population. But one thing that we can do, and, and I haven't uh, gone too far there, is to change the metric. So one of the beauty of EPC is that there's really three parts. There's the leave one out and there's the KDE. And these two methods works well together because they are efficient to apply in the context of a leave one out. And we believe we'll, we'll stick with those. But the Matthew correlation coefficient, we believe is not the one to use in all circumstances. And in this situation where you just, uh, that, that you just talked about, it would be very interesting to identify some metric that would keep those guys that are able to fish out a small portion of the population 
and then taken together, these different markers can be used uh, with a method that allows interaction to make a good prediction. And, uh, but that's not something we've tried so far, but I mean, intuitively, it seems like a fairly good idea. Uh, but but in, in our case, uh, for sure, it's not a good idea to pick gene based on standard deviation. That, that was a bad idea. And picking gene randomly is, is, is very disappointing. So that's something we want to avoid. So Bianca has a suggestion actually along those lines that she just put in the chat. What about using a KL divergence of the two distributions? Uh, yeah, that, so, so, so in order to build a further predictor, I'm assuming that that's the suggestion from Bianca. Yeah, I think so. Because, because, because if not, then you are falling back into the, uh, the, the problem that the statistics is identifying. You could end up with a situation where the KL divergence is going to show you that the two distributions are sufficiently different, uh, but they, they are not interesting to, to make a prediction. But that, that would be one way in which the, we could build uh, the, the metric in that specific case. It, Good. It, would, it would not exploit the, uh, the classifier. The... Right, that's right. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, I think we've had quite a discussion already, so that, that's really nice. So once again, Sebastien, uh, thanks a lot. That was a really fun talk and uh, also, I think, uh, approachable for pretty much everybody uh, in, in, in the audience and, and yet everybody learned something. So uh, that, that's really the right tone. Um, so thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to us and uh, and My when the COVID becomes more uh, tame, we'll uh, treat you to a beer at Miguel. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Which is a, not a promise that is very <laughs> <laughs> likely to be realized anytime soon. But. Good. Thank you very much, Matsu. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Thanks, Sebastian. And see you, everybody. <laughs> see you next Bye. week.